Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new topic, inverse functions and the inverse trigonometric functions. Ian here, and I'll be starting us off with an introduction to inverse functions. We'll start by looking at what an inverse function actually is. Then we'll look at how we find them, and finally we'll look at their properties. After that, we'll wrap it up with a summary. So let's get started by looking at what inverse functions actually are. I got majorly tripped up by this in school, so I'm going to take some time to go through this really carefully. Hopefully we're all familiar with functions by now. Functions are relationships between x and y. And when I first learned about functions, it was described to me like a machine. We plug in some input x, do some operations like multiply x or add to it, and then we get out some output which is a function of x, which we call y. So a particular function might be y equals 4x plus 1. So what we do is plug in our input x. Then inside the machine, we apply the operations of multiplying by 4, and then adding 1. And then we get our output, which of course depends on what our value of x is going to be. As you might have guessed by the name, inverse functions take a bit of a different approach. We call them inverse functions because they apply the inverse operations compared to our original function. If we were to think about this in terms of the function machine, if we tried to put our input in backwards, the machine would freak out and do the backwards of what it was meant to do. Instead of multiplying by 4 and then adding 1, it would firstly subtract 1 and then divide by 4. So our output of y would be given by x minus 1 over 4. If we make x the subject in this equation, we get x equal to 4y plus 1, which you might notice is exactly the same as our original function, but we've swapped the x and the y. That's really important, keep that in mind. So that's what an inverse function is. It's the function you get by applying the inverse operations to what we were meant to. If our original function was f of x, then this is the notation we use for an inverse function. The same for your inverse trigonometric ratios. Now it's all well and good of working through the logic of seeing what operations were in our original function and then inverting each one to find the inverse function, but surely there's a quicker way. And of course, there is. So let's look at how we can quickly find inverse functions. In our example before, we found that our original function and our inverse function were exactly the same, but with the x and the y swapped. That's our key. To find the inverse function of a given function, you need to swap the x's and the y's in the relation. So say we had the function y equals to x cubed over 2 plus 1, and that has a graph of this. To find the inverse function, we firstly swap the x's and the y's, which gives us x equal to y cubed over 2 plus 1. And this is our inverse function. This is sometimes called the inverse relation, because right now it's a function of y. So if we want to plot it, we need to make y the subject. So, this is just simple manipulation, chuck the 1 to the left hand side, multiply by 2, giving us y cubed equal to 2 outside of x minus 1, and then y is equal to the cube root of 2 outside of x minus 1. And this is its graph. So, if our original function was x cubed over 2 plus 1, then our inverse function is the cube root of 2 outside of x minus 1. That's all there is to it. Similarly, Let's say we had the function y equal to x squared minus 2. Then to invert, firstly swap the x and the y, giving us x equal to y squared minus 2. And now we solve for y. y squared is equal to x plus 2, so that means y is equal to plus or minus the square root of x plus 2. So again, on our graph, this is our inverse function. There's a little bit of a problem though, because as you can see, this line isn't actually a function. Remember, a function can only have one y value for each x value, and to test if something isn't a function, we use the vertical line test. Clearly, this x value has more than one y value, so technically it's not an inverse function, you could call it an inverse relation, but I'll touch more on this function or not a function business in the next video. So that's a little bit of sizzle, get excited. In general, this is how we find our inverse functions. We swap the x's and the y's and go for gold. The last thing we need to look at in this video is the properties of inverse functions, because you can see in our two graphs there's clearly something going on. The inverse functions kind of have the same shape as the original, there's a bit of a mirror effect going on, something like a reflection. And if we add in the line y equals x, this becomes clear. Graphically, the inverse function, or relation if you want to be technical, is a reflection of the original function in the line y equals x. So for example, here's y equals x squared and the line y equals x. The inverse is a reflection in this line. 
but that means that points on the line are going to be shared by both. So since y equals x squared touches the line at both the origin and x equals 1, the inverse also goes through these points. Another thing to come out of this reflective property is that the higher above the line y equals x that our original function goes, the further to the right of y equals x the inverse is pushed. Out of this comes a very important property. For functions that have an inverse function, so here this means a function that passes the vertical line test, so it has a one-to-one -one relationship, it has this property. If our function f of x is in a domain between a and b, and it has a range between y1 and y2, then the domain of our inverse function is x between y1 and y2, and it has a range between a and b. That is, the domain of our inverse function is the original function's range, and the range of our inverse function is the domain of our original function. This just hammers home our reflection property, and it makes things a bit easier to graph, as we'll see in the next video. Let's remember, we got inverse functions by swapping the x's and the y's. So it makes sense that the set of possible x values for f of x makes up the set of possible y values for our inverse, and vice versa. Let's look at one final example to hammer this home. Let's let our function of x be e to the x, and it has an inverse function of ln x. I'll let you check that yourself. We can see that the domain of e to the x is all x, because we can plug in any number. But because it's only in the top half of the graph, its range is y greater than 0. In contrast, our log graph has a domain of x greater than 0, the range of e to the x. And we can see its range is all possible y, the domain of e to the x. So, the domain of our inverse is the range of our original function, and the range of our inverse is the domain of the original function. So those are some useful properties that will help you out with inverse functions. But sadly, that's all we've got time for in this video. The next video is going to expand on some of this and introduce some trig functions. So get excited. But for now, let's summarize what we've done here. Inverse functions apply the inverse operations of those in our original function. We can find them by swapping the x and the y in our function and solving for y. But note that not every inverse function is technically a function. If it doesn't pass the vertical line test, it's just a relation. Graphically, the inverse function is just a reflection of our original function in the line y equals x. And finally, the domain of our inverse function is just the range of our original function, and the range of our inverse function is the domain of our original function. It's a bit of a mouthful, I know, but you'll get used to it. I promise. So that's it for this video, guys. Catch you next time.